your plan better, Father, and help us to understand you better and how you're working through the times in which we live now. Father, just give us your perspective on things. We want to look at the world through your eyes and not through our own. And Father, to comprehend all that you are doing and seeking to accomplish. And Father, better to understand how we can be involved in what's going on. Can we just thank you for the freedom that we have to gather? Thank you for those who are here, for safely bringing them here, Father, and just pray for our time together. We'd be glorifying to you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So we will get into Daniel, but I wanted to <clears throat> intro New Testament first. So <clears throat> I wanted to cover some introductory matters, and then we'll, we'll get into Daniel. And we're not going to exhaustively get into Daniel tonight. I want to set the stage for next week. Next week we'll get into talking about uh, the intertestamental period. And the reason why I want to do that is because from Daniel, we're going to establish for ourselves a historical setting for the New Testament. There are stuff that, that happened over the time in those what we call 400 silent years that set the stage for the coming of Christ and all that was going to happen. And there's things that, you know, coming to the close of the Old Testament, synagogues and Pharisees and Sadducees and all of those things didn't exist and all of a sudden, during this intertestamental period, those things arise in the nation of Israel. We come in the time of Christ and the Gospels, synagogue, synagogue worship was normal. It's common every place. Well, where did all that come from? Now, we're not going to get into an exhaustive study of it because this is not a history class per se. So I will talk about the different periods, the different influences, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, and their impact. And, and all of that, we talked about Simon's name who was called Peter by Christ, Cephas, which is the Aramaic form, but from the name that his parents gave him, we see that there was some clear Hellenistic influence, and that was the Seleucids. They made an attempt, an aggressive attempt, to Hellenize everybody, and that's going back to Alexander. That was his main intent for coming and conquering the world, was he wanted to spread the Greek culture everywhere. So all of that helps sort of set the stage for the, the New Testament, understanding what's going on there and the things that are happening and the different groups that we encounter there, Herodians, Zealots. You know, some think that, that the term zealot refers to, you know, a demeanor. And it's not. It was a particular group that existed during that time. This is staggering because when you understand those things and you see here you have Matthew or Levi, the tax collector, who was a Jew who gave himself over to the Roman Empire to work for them, to serve them, to make money on his, uh, you know, from his own people for his own benefit and for the empire. He was an outcast. He was repulsed. That was, a, that was a heinous thing for you to do as a Jew, to be a tax collector. And then you have someone who's a zealot who was so zealous for his people that they fought against the Roman Empire. They wanted to have a, a militaristic overthrow of the empire. And then you have Jesus who's going to bring them together and they're going to be a part of the Twelve. That's just crazy. Right? But that's the work of Christ. And so when we understand these things, then all of a sudden things in the New Testament come to life. We understand the life context of what's going on, all the things that are there. But to sort of set the premise and, and set the stage before we move into the New Testament, we looked at this and we went through Old Testament survey. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the fact that the Old Testament is the foundation. It is the base for what is to come. The New Testament is the culmination of that. I give you this quote from Eric Sauer. He says, The Old Testament is promise and expectation. New Testament is fulfillment and completion. The old is the marshalling of the hosts to the battle of God. The new is the triumph of the crucified one. The old is the twilight and the dawn of morning. The new is the rising sun and the height of the eternal day. And so we can get a sense of the, the relationship of these two put together, and they're important. So <clears throat> we've done our groundwork in the Old Testament. We understand some things. We'll go back and pick up some of those things as we move into the New Testament. So essentially we could talk about Old Testament history and New Testament history in this way. We have foreshadowing in the old, promise in the old, problems in the old, commencement, and then we have fulfillment, performance, solution, and consummation in the New Testament. And again, it's just following God's progressive revelation, and that's really what we're going to attempt to do when we go through the New Testament. We've done that with the Old Testament, allowing God to tell His story rather than tell the story it for Him, right? And, and I'm really going to, I'll talk about some things, but I'm really going to try not to impose anything upon the text. And I, I always try to do that, but I know that as a human being, I'm fallible, and sometimes we do do that. But our attempt is to just let the text speak for itself. Far too often, 
we suppose things, we assume things, and then we, we impress those things on the Scriptures, and I don't want to do that. And especially when we come to the New Testament, and how we'll look at the books. I just want to be cautious in the order of which we look at them. So summary thought, the New Testament continues the story begun in the Old Testament is the marvelous climax of God's inspired, or literally according to 2 Timothy 3.16, it is the inspired word of God, His revelation. It is the God-breathed revelation to mankind. In the Old Testament, God promised to bring blessing and redemption to man through the Messiah. And the New Testament is the record of God's doing just that. <clears throat> Without the 27 books of the New Testament, there would be a great uncertainty regarding the promises and purposes of God, and many significant questions remain unanswered. So we, need, we needed these last 27 books to be given to us so that we have a full, complete revelation from God, and we have that. Because of that, I don't think there's any more revelation to be given. From Genesis to Revelation, we have all that we need, and if I applicationally take the last part of Revelation, the last words of Christ in Revelation, there's nothing left to be given. So we should have, when we get done with this course, from the Old Testament to now, we should have a nice, good, good solid grasp of all of Scripture and what's happening in God's plan. We won't have it all imprinted on our memories, but hopefully we'll do so over time. The New Testament is much smaller than the Old Testament. It covers a period of time far shorter than that of the Old Testament. So here's just some simple facts. In regards to the Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament, we have 39 books. We have 929 chapters, covers over 4,000 years, and about 31 authors. The New Testament, we have 27 books, 260 chapters, covers about 100 years, and about 9 authors. So the bulk of Revelation comes in the Old Testament. It sets the foundation. It's a solid foundation. There's so much there that has prepared the way for what is to come in the new, and so the new then is just the completion of that. And again, far too many spend time in the Old Testament, and it really is necessary for us to have a grasp of what's happening there. The amazing thing is the cohesiveness of it all. When you think about the scriptures, if you think about all the authors, the different time periods, the different backgrounds, right? The different geographical locations that they had written from, all of these variants that went into this, and yet it is one comprehensive, unified revelation. There's no other book that exists that's like the Word of God. Nowhere. And there is no book, historically, and you ask anyone, whether secular or Christian, there is no book that has been as preserved as the Word of God has. For the amount of manuscripts that we have to preserve the accuracy of what we have in our translations, at least the better ones, there's no other book out there like it. Closest is the Iliad. And it is nowhere in comparison to what we have in the New Testament. So we should always be affirmed as to the truth that we have, the solid foundation on which we build when we look at all of these books together. But the New Testament covers the most significant era in history of man, those years when God took on flesh and brought salvation to lost mankind. The New Testament is worthy of a lifetime of study. It answers so many significant questions that people ask. What is the purpose of life? Is there really real hope? What is God like? Can I be freed from guilt and sin? Am I loved? The Bible answers all these, especially in the New Testament. We look at Christ, the Word of God. He is the profound answer to all of this. And the Old Testament prepared the way for this great revelation. And that's why we refer to Christ as being the climax of God's revelation. Right? I mean, He is the one, as John says in John chapter 1, verse 18, He is the one literally who exegeted the Father to us. And so He is the pinnacle of what God has revealed to us. The purpose of this study, several things I lay out for you. The purpose of the study is to assist, to assist in seeing the content, unity, and progression of New Testament scriptures. And I'll talk about in just a moment as far as how we'll look at the New Testament, how that fits together. But in order to understand the content of the New Testament, each of the books will be studied, noting themes, emphases found in them. Now, we realize that I cannot go verse by verse and cover each one of them. It's just impossible. We would never finish. This is a survey, so that's what we're attempting to do. So <clears throat> we are going to do a broad sweep of all the books in the New Testament. 
and wrestling with how we're going to accomplish this. There's, there's one sense in which there is a very natural order. So some might ask, well, how does the, the New Testament fit together? And, and it's really easy in one sense. When you look at the New Testament, you have the Gospels, then you have Acts, and then you have the Epistles. It's a pretty clear flow. Right, the coming of Christ, and then He ascends, and then we have the church, and then we have how to live in light of the church. But I ask the question, is there a theme that really binds all of them together? We, we looked in the Old Testament, we saw a chronological order, <clears throat> and that's what we followed, following the narrative. It's a little bit tougher when we come to the New Testament as, to fo- as far as following the narrative. But we can see when we look at books that there is some progression, there is some connection, there is some flow. So when we looked at this last Sunday, looking at Luke and Acts, two books put together, they were meant to go together, we see a flow. We have the progression that happens, the baptizer, the 12, the 70 or 72, the disciples, then the church when we get into Acts 1, and we have the geographical reference to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Now what's interesting is that if you look at these two books and the flow of them together, you can actually broaden it. There is a geographical chiastic structure to two of these books. We have the Roman world, chapter 2, verse 1 and 3, 1. We have Judea and Samaria from 952 to 1927. Then we have Jerusalem, 1928 to 2412. Fascinating because in Luke's gospel, 951, he resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem, Jesus did, right? And there is that constant notation of progression that is there. We also see it in the overall geographical structure of the book. If you notice in the first couple chapters of Luke's gospel, you will see that John and his parents are moving away from Jerusalem, where Jesus and parents are moving towards Jerusalem. It's preparing us for what is to come in the progression of Luke's narrative. And then we get to Acts, we move from Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the Roman world. So we can see with individual books that there's a connection, there's a flow, there are pieces that that put together, but is there an overall theme that binds the New Testament together or there helps us to understand what's happening? Let me suggest something to you, okay? So put this in your head, we'll come back and look at it later. Going back to Genesis, okay, we have the whole race the human race, in chapters 1 through 11. Then we have the focus on the family of Abraham. Okay? Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, is the Abrahamic covenant. That is the pivotal point, not just for Genesis, but I suggest it is the pivotal point for all of the rest of Scripture. Okay? <clears throat> From this covenant that God makes with Abraham, He is going to expound on that covenant, which we looked at. And He is going to elaborate on the Abrahamic covenant. He promises three things, land, seed, and blessing. The first aspect, land, he's going to develop in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. This is dealing with the Palestinian covenant. And God promises him he's going to restore them back to their land. This is yet to be fulfilled. There are those who think that the church replaced Israel and that they're not out of, not now out of the game plan and forever out of the game plan. And that's not true. The land aspect is still to be fulfilled. If I use a literal hermeneutic, that's what I come to. Okay? The next aspect is going to be developed in the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12-16, through 16, the seed. And this is the fulfillment we find with Christ. He is the fulfillment of this. Ultimately, the fulfillment is going to come with His reign in the millennial kingdom. The third aspect is the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31-34, and this is the blessing, spiritual blessing. Now, part of this is fulfilled now, Okay? In, in the sense that when Jeremiah 31, if you read the passage there, we went through there, two things that, that are, are experienced now by us as believers, and that is forgiveness of sins and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But there are still aspects of this covenant to be fulfilled in the millennial reign of Christ, and we still await those. So there is this already and not yet with these prophecies, okay? And, and Scripture is clear by this. <clears throat> That's why I say we have to be so careful not to draw such distinct lines and severing and say, this is done here, this is done there, and there is no flow of what's happening. We, we, we mess so much theology up and truth up when we start doing that, and that's the problem I have with systematic theology so often. So let me develop from this final one the new covenant. Okay, Since we are partakers of the new covenant now, and Jesus said what? At the Lord's Supper. This is the what? New covenant in my blood, Right? So he is indicating the inauguration of this fulfillment of this covenant. All right? So let me suggest this to you then. 
that this is possibly a theme that binds the New Testament books together. So we have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the Acts, the Acts of the Apostles it's called, but it's better to be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that when we get to Acts. And then we have the Epistles. We have the Pauline Epistles and the General Epistles. General Epistles are Hebrew, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. And then we have the Revelation. Okay. So if I can just do this for you, plant this seed in your head, We'll water it later, but just think on this. When we get to the Gospels, we're talking about the new covenant instituted, right? The coming of Christ. This is the new covenant in my blood. He institutes it at His coming, especially at His death. The Acts then would be the new covenant proclaimed. They're going to proclaim the forgiveness of sins, and those who receive Christ as their Lord and Savior are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and to be so until we're taken to be with the Lord. The epistles, then, would be the new covenant lived out. And then Revelation will be the new covenant fulfilled. Now, if we, again, following the Abrahamic covenant going back to Genesis, seeing the, de the development throughout the Old Testament, and as it then carries in the New Testament, I suggest to you that it's possible to look at all the books of the New Testament with this overriding theme that runs through them. And I spent time, a bit of time on the phone with my dad today to just make sure to get his feedback and say, am I imposing anything on the text? And I really don't believe so. So i just presenting to you as an idea, however. And it's interesting when we look at these things, I, I truly believe that the overriding theme that runs through all the Scripture is the kingdom of God. That's just a different time and day. But I, I believe that going from Old Testament to New Testament, we see an overriding emphasis on the kingdom of God, His rule and reign. So basically from Genesis to Revelation, it is God's dominion or rulership. And there's different ways in which that is worked out. But I just suggest this for the New Testament. We all tracking? Yes, sir. Epistles, letters. It's the Greek term for writing of a letter. So we are going to attempt to move through the New Testament, looking at Gospels first, then Acts, then the Epistles. We'll follow that, that progression. Although we realize chronologically that's not necessarily so, right? If we look at the date of the writing of the books, what's the first book written in the New Testament? Anybody know? Yes. James. James is the first book written for the New Testament. The last book, the Revelation. And that's important to know because some will actually argue that Revelation was written much earlier and not the final book. And therefore, they use that as an argument for why we can still have Revelation today. I wish you wouldn't have done this because I had a hard time before. There, you, you said they're made that way because that's the way it should be read. Am I correct? In, in, this, in the New Testament, it's, it's different. In the Old Testament, there's that clear narrative that runs all the way through it. And then you can see how the other books complement that flow, that narrative. And the story keeps moving. It's a little bit tougher with the New Testament to do. But there is still that sense of the Gospels, the Nacks, and the Epistles. So there is that flow, and we'll follow that and stick to that. I think it's, there's a little bit more complexity with the Old Testament than there is with the New. Fortunately, because the New is just shorter. So, discovering historical setting for the New Testament. This is where I want to spend the rest of our time tonight and we'll look at Daniel. So, if you want to turn to Daniel with me. And again, I'm just opening up the door to Daniel. So, we'll go back and some of this is review, but I actually always do new stuff. So, I never try to, I, I just can't ever regurgitate anything. I just can't do it. I can't re preach a sermon exactly the same way I preached it the first time. It's impossible for me to do that because I, I believe that every time you go back to a passage and study, you're going to learn something new. So every time I come back to this stuff, I'm going to learn something new. So I have changed charts and, that I've done on this book and added some things. So there are some new insights that I've had since we've gone through the survey part. So, But I want to get to 
Mainly what I want to look at is chapter 2, but primarily chapter 7. Those are going to set stages for me. Chapter 8, they're going to set stages for the intertestamental period. We're going to see at the end of the Old Testament, Persia is the main empire that's ruling in the intertestamental period. It's going to be Greece, and then Rome's going to come on the scene. So we'll look at those different periods, but I just wanted to go to Daniel to sort of set the stage. But we have to begin with this and talking about God, because before there was anything, there was God. And we have to understand that He is in control of everything. So I give you some thoughts to chew on. He is the eternal without beginning, the cause of all causes, yet Himself uncaused. He is the uncaused cause. There's no one, you know, when, when the child asks, well, where did God come from? God didn't come from anywhere. God has always been, right? He is eternal. He was above the whole course of time. He, beyond explanation, possesses oneness of essence, and yet three in person, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the living one, the only God. He is the one who created the universe, and therefore he is the one who designed the plan, Okay. So the universal plan originated from God as creator. He is the source of all that exists outside of himself. Everything arose from his will and lives by reason of his creative energies. One of my favorite passages in Acts chapter 17, In him we live, move, and have our being. No one does anything without God. Nothing. We don't live, we don't move, we don't breathe, we don't do anything without God's creative energies working through us. The question is, what do we do with those that he's given to us, Right? But we have to understand this because when we come to talk about history and we're going to look at the movements in the intertestamental period, we call them the 400 silent years, but that doesn't mean God was not at work. God was fulfilling word that he prophesied through Daniel long before those times happened. God was at work. He was moving empires. I mean, just the, the, the staggering thought alone of the progression, and when you start with Philip of Macedon, Alexander's father, he's the one who had the idea to unite all the Grecian people together because until then, they were a bunch of city-states. They were all pockets of, of people all over the place, and they were separated by boundaries like mountains and all of this stuff. And so they all had their own dialects, but there was a common element to all of the Greek dialects. This is a fascinating study when you get into linguistics. We can trace it all back to that one common language, but that's for another day. But they had all these pockets of Grecian people all over the place. His father had the idea of, I'm going to unite this empire under my rule. And there were other times where they united to fight against enemies and so on. They would group and different tribes would come together and they would come together and fight and then they would go back to their territories and to their ways. Well, Philip decided he was going to unite them all together and he started the process. Alexander is the one who was going to bring it to fulfillment. He actually brought them so unified together that it actually unified the Greek language so that it was the common tongue that was spoken during the New Testament period. And there was so much that his military, in bringing all of these different people together, he helped solidify the Greek language. But God did all of this. God was working behind the scenes. God declared that Alexander was going to come and he was going to have this meteoric rise and then he was going to be put away. But God told through Daniel all this stuff was going to take place. So this stuff didn't just happen. God worked it all out. God was setting a global stage. Think about that, a global stage for the coming of Christ. These are important things for us to understand because when we look at the world events around us and people can run in panic and we should be aware of what's happening, but we don't need to be afraid because we know who's in control of everything. So I give you this thought, by consequences, then everything must belong to God since he's the creator of it. Because the universe is his work, it is his property. Because each creature is his work, it must also be his instrument. All things must remain subject to him and be always at his disposal. Since God created the universe, he can do whatever he wants with it. We don't like that as human beings. That disturbs us. But it's just a simple fact. It's just a simple fact. So therefore, he can raise up empires, he can bring them down, he can destroy peoples, and he can raise them up, and he can do so at his will because he's the creator. And when we see the rise and fall of empires, we realize people die, people are put to death, there's battle, there's conflict. And God's going to work in all of that, but it's by his design that it happens. So God is then the Lord of all history. The earthbound ingredients of history are several things. We talk about history, we're talking about people, places, things, actions, and time. And God is the Lord of all history, and He blends these ingredients together, and He sovereignly exercises His will to bring about what He wants to bring about.
That is why then when we can talk about the, the historical and religious setting of the New Testament, it's not accidental. It's like Peter says, things don't just happen. Well, we say that, right? It just happens. But the reality is it doesn't just happen. Right? God's sovereignly in control of everything. We had a great discussion with the kids the other night. We were at Bible time. We were talking about God's sovereign rule that not a speck of dust moved through the air without God controlling everything. You see, we, we look at life and we may not always understand it. We may not always, always see the hand of God in everything, but by faith we must recognize that that is a fact. By faith we must recognize His presence and His working in everything, even though we may not discern it. It's easier for us when we look at our own lives to see God's sovereign hand, right? It's easier for us to look at nations like Israel and see His sovereign hand. But when we walk through the everyday experiences of life, sometimes it's hard for us to discern that. But we need to know it's always there. It's always there. God never relinquishes control of anything. Isaiah captures a great thought for me as we come into Daniel. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand. This is the plan devised against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out against all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? And the answer is nobody. Nobody. So the reality of this passage in Isaiah is because of God's sovereign control over all nations, nothing can thwart His plans by turning back His hand. God can move nations. And Daniel will prophesy about that, and next week we will look at how God had moved nations to bring about the historical setting for the coming of Christ. That's right, when we read in Galatians, right? And the time was fulfilled. Mark, as we started to look at the Gospel of Mark, the time is fulfilled, right? That crucial moment, that certain moment, that particular moment, according to God's design, it came to fulfillment. So we looked at the progression Old Testament. We have the era of formation from Abraham to Joshua, a people law and land. We looked at the era of theocracy from Joshua to Saul, priests and judges. We looked at the era of monarchy, and I would suggest that we change the title of that. I changed it to a the theocratic monarchy. Because God never relinquishes reign. He's always in sovereign control of everything. And then we have the era of restoration from Jeremiah to Nehemiah. We have captivity and restoration. So that brings us into the 400 silent years. So roughly, let me just give you a picture. From 400 B.C., looking at leaders and preachers, world powers, religious groups, vernacular, and place of worship, several changes happen between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New at the end of the Old Testament, we find as far as leaders and preachers, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi. Okay? The world power, Persia, from the east. They are the predominant power as we come to the close of the Old Testament. The religious groups, the priests. And they function. Now, some of them who are functioning as priests, we find that when they came back and returned to Jerusalem, some were taken out of the priestly service because they had no lineage and they couldn't prove it, so therefore they were removed from the lists of priests. But for the most part, this was the religious group that existed, and the, the, the more influence came from the line of the priests. The vernacular, Hebrew. Although we start to see usages of Aramaic during this time. And then we have the place of worship, the temple. And they're going to return to Jerusalem, and this is so now. When they're in Jerusalem, we have the returnees under Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel. This is where we find the nation. These are the, the leaders, the preachers, the world power, the religious groups, the vernacular, and the temple worship. When we come to the New Testament period then, the leaders and preachers, John the Baptist and Jesus, this is what starts it off for us. John is the first voice that speaks after 400 silent years as far as humanity is concerned. The real first real actual voice spoken was the angel Gabriel, right? That was the first time that God communicated to man in, in that per time period in this way. As far as the real power, Rome from the West. The religious groups, we have scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. We have the Sanhedrin. I mean, all of this stuff didn't exist before. So some major stuff happened in the, in the 400 silent years historically. And we come to the vernacular language that was used, Aramaic and Greek. 
Many of the people forgot their Hebrew dialect. They forgot their native tongue. They were using Aramaic. And by the time we find the New Testament writings, everything was written in Greek because that was the lingua franca. That was the language of the day. That was the common tongue that everyone used. And then the place of worship, temple, and synagogues. So much happens between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. There's some major transitions that take place. And Daniel is going to introduce us into some of that historical setting, and then we'll talk about some of the developments of these other areas. But this is just the big picture of the close of the old to the beginning of the new. All right. We have to end right at 8, right? <clears throat> All right. We'll truck it. Most of it, introductory part's going to be reviewed. So I'm, I'm just going to walk through the outline. You can follow me and I'll, I'll elaborate where I need to. Mostly I just want to get to chapters 2, chapter 7, and I have some diagrams sort of frame out the times for you. And then we'll come back and look at these things in a little more detail next week. So don't be afraid if you don't get everything. And if you want these charts, you can ask me and I'll make hard copies. So. Yeah, if you'd like, I can I can convert that in a hard copy for you. <laughs> so we've looked at the dividing of the kingdom. The kingdom was united. Saul, basically. David, really, he's the one who united the kingdom. Solomon, it divided as a result of his sin and his son. And we have the vision in the northern kingdom and the southern. The vision happens at 931 B.C. We have the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity. Assyrian captivity happened in 722 B.C. And then the Babylonian happens in three phases. 605, 597, and 586. Daniel was taken captive in 605 B.C. Young man, he's taken there and he's going to be trained up and raised up and he's going to serve there. And as far as we know historically, he never leaves there. Which is amazing. I mean, the, the, Here's a man who worked in this political system right? But was a servant of God. <clears throat> so this is the time period we're looking at. And if we could sum up Daniel, it is God rules the world. That's really what it is. We look at some statements from Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. But at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my knowledge was restored. Then I praised the Most High and I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. In verse 35, chapter 4, he says this, All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases. Again, go back to my introductory statements, the fact that God is creator of all things. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? This is the thing that's staggering to me. How often we're reminded in Scripture, no one questions God. Right? It's like Paul says in Romans 9. Right? Who are you, O oh man, to question the potter? But it's amazing to me the goal that we have as human beings to question God, to challenge Him. Who are you to do that? But He's so gracious. He's so gracious because He could really put us in our place, but He doesn't. Right? He doesn't. But we need to remember that He is the one who is sovereign over all. The book of Daniel has been described as the greatest book in the Bible on the godless kingdoms and the kingdom of God. Scroge, you make this statement. The godless kingdoms, the Gentile nations, and the kingdom of God, the millennial reign centered about Jerusalem. All of this is covered in Daniel's work. The grand truth which applies to all kingdoms is summed up in four words, God rules the world. If we can walk through the book of Daniel, here it is. The personal history, chapter 1. Prophetic history of the Gentiles, chapters 2 through 7. And personal history is written in Hebrew. The, the prophetic history about the Gentiles is written in Aramaic. And this is important to understand because this was the vernacular of the day. This was the, the language of the Chaldean court. And Daniel was taken captive into this realm, and that's where he learned the language. He was schooled in their literature and in the language of the Chaldeans. He knew Aramaic. He knew how to write it. And these sections that deal with the Gentile kingdoms or the Gentile powers, he writes it in Aramaic. And at this time, this was not only the language of the court, but this was the commercial tongue that was used. It's like if you go around the world and you're in the, the commercial realm, people speak English. It's the same thing as far as the Aramaic in those days. <clears throat> 
It's interesting that in this main section that has Aramaic, we have 15 Persian words and three Grecian ones that you'll find. But so Daniel was pretty well schooled when he served in the courts, starting with Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, when he moves into chapters 8 through 12, we have the prophetic history of Israel, and he's going to return to the Hebrew language again. So the sections that deal with Gentile powers are Aramaic, but the rest that deals with the, the history of Israel is going to be in Hebrew. And in the center section, 2 through 7, we have the destinies in God's hands, chapter 2. We have destinies in God's hands, chapter 7. And both of them are looking at things from a different perspective, both of these chapters, although they're dealing with the same prophecy. But they're looking from different angles. The first one, even the imagery that's used, right, is different than the imagery that's used in chapter 7. But in the middle of this, we have the impotence and opposing God, 3 through 6. And this is Daniel in a nutshell, if you will. All right, so let's walk through Daniel quickly together to set the stage. We have the personal history of Daniel, chapter 1, and verses 1 through 21. We have Daniel's deportation, first seven verses, Daniel's devotion to God, 8 through 16, then Daniel's appointment, chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. And we all pretty much know that aspect of the story. Daniel then moves to the prophetic plan for the Gentiles in 2, 1 through 7, 28. And this indicates the times of the Gentiles. This is really what he is talking about. They were, the, the times of the Gentiles began with Nebuchadnezzar and taking of Jerusalem and conquering right, the kingdom and bringing them under his power. That began the times of the Gentiles. When we find Zechariah noting his prophecy, he does so by a Gentile monarch. All the other prophets, right, before the times of the Gentiles, would indicate it by a monarch of Israel or Judah. But with Zechariah, we have a Gentile one. That helps us to understand the times of the Gentiles are in full swing then. Okay? And this period is going to continue on, and I'll give you a chart that I did to sort of give you a visual perspective of how all this stuff fits together. So in chapter 2, we have Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great image, 2, 1 through 49. We have the dream of the king in 1 through 16, the dream revealed to Daniel in verses 17 through 23. And this is interesting because we have reference that comes in this chapter about the God of heaven. And I find it fascinating. The first time we find it is in verse 18. It's used six times in Daniel. It's used nine times in Ezra, four times in Nehemiah, and only four times in all of the rest of the New Old Testament. Right? So six times in Daniel, nine times in Ezra, which is very fascinating. Just ponder that for a while. But it's a significant term. And again, you're talking about the fact that God rules everything. He's the God of heaven, and He controls all that is underneath it. Right? So then we have the dream that is explained in chapter 2, verses 24 through 45. <clears throat> so here is the image which we all know. This is the image that, that Nebuchadnezzar has in his dream. Daniel is then going to come and explain his dream to him. And we have several kingdoms that are reflected. We have the head of gold. We have the breast and arms of silver. We have the belly and thighs of bronze. We have the legs of iron. And we have the feet of iron and clay. The last two are connected together. They're both Rome, but the second one is the revived Rome. And I'll show you when we get to chapter 7 that there is a parenthesis, a huge parenthesis of time between these two. All right, <clears throat> so the five empires rule over Israel. Here are pictured as parts of the structure of the body. In Daniel 7, they are represented as four great beasts. So you say, well, there's five here, but there's four over there. But remember that the final two are connected together. They're both Rome, first and second Rome or revived Rome, however you want to say it. These empires are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the later revived Rome. Each one differentiated from the previous is indicated by the declining quality of metal as you move down through the structure. 
So if I could just picture for you the different kingdoms that Daniel deals with in his prophecy. In chapters 2 and 7, we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and then Rome revived. Then in chapters 8 and 11, we have Medo-Persia, we have Greece, and then we have Rome revived. And these are essentially the kingdoms that Daniel is going to deal with as he gives his prophecy and again, has so much, I mean, the broad span of time that Daniel is dealing with. He is talking not only about his time, but he is going to cover New Testament period all the way into the millennial kingdom is what he's going to prophesy about. Okay? But I'll just say to you, he had no idea about the church. None of his prophecy pertains to the church. It has to do with the times in which the church arose and all those things, but he didn't prophesy about the church. So the prophets in the Old Testament didn't know the full plan of God. They were given things to reveal to the people, to make known to the people, but there was a lot they didn't understand. And the reality is, even today, we are agnostic. <laughs> we are. To a degree, we're all agnostic. In other words, we can't know. There are things we are not meant to know. Deuteronomy. The things I give to you are yours, right? The rest, mine. And, and far too often, I think we keep trying to push ourselves across that line to understand things that don't belong to us. And what happens is we end up doing is we start reasoning and speculating and assuming, trying to fill in gaps where God does not fill in gaps. And I just say we have to be so cautious. And if we're really committed to being driven by the Word of God, solely by the Word of God, we won't cross that line. The stone then pictured is Christ at his second coming. He will destroy the fourth empire in its final phase with a catastrophic suddenness. Christ's total shattering of Gentile power results in the establishment of his millennial kingdom, the ultimate empire, then continuing into eternity. And I believe that there is going to be a literal millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. And we find that in Revelation chapter 20. I use a literal hermeneutic. I trust you all do as well. There are those who will interpret Genesis 1 literally, but then when they get to Revelation in that, they will interpret it figuratively. Ah mills, that's what they do. So they believe the kingdom is now, and this is it. Right? Yeah, and they expect that it's going to progress and grow, so they see this mountain, it's going to continue. It's not going to happen. Right? So Daniel then is honored because he can explain the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. Then we have Nebuchadnezzar's image of gold in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And then Nebuchadnezzar's vision of a great tree in 4, 1 through 37. This is an interesting chapter. Just notice with me the structure of it. it sandwiches aren't only found in the New Testament. Sandwiches are found in the Old. Notice what happens. Nebuchadnezzar begins with praise in 4, 1 through 3. Then he's going to end this section with praise in verses 34 through 37. And, and it's all about, you know, focusing on the, the, the supremacy of God. And in the middle of this is the reason for His praise. What issues forth in this kind of worship from the lips of Nebuchadnezzar is what happens in verses 4 through 33. That's just a freebie for you. So in this chapter, we have Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation in chapter 4, verses 28 through 33. We have the statement from himself. He says, all that has happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this great Babylon I have built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? And this is a representation of what his empire would have looked like back in the day. I mean, it was pretty impressive. He was a world power. There was much that was accomplished. There were so many peoples that were, were located within this empire that he ruled over. And we find reflections of the, the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And it's interesting because if you look at chapter 7, how is the kingdom of Babylon represented? By a lion with eagle's wings. We find these monuments all over the excavations. <clears throat> They were known for their gardens. They were known for their hanging gardens. There was a pretty impressive empire and the control that Nebuchadnezzar had. And we still have remnants of that kingdom that still exist today to attest to the validity of that empire and the prestige of it and all of that. But Nebuchadnezzar, as he looks upon all this, he says, look what I did, right? Look at what I accomplished for myself. 
Verse 31 of chapter 4, while words were still on his lips, when a voice came from heaven, this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals and you will eat grass like cattle. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. So this is a representation of what they think that he looked like as a result of that, right? This was likely took place around 750 B.C. Okay, it's probably around, Daniel was probably around the age 50 when this happened, but around 570 B.C. and it was for a seven-year period. Then he is going to be restored. And we find this recorded for us in chapter 4, verses 34 through 37. And at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven. Because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. We have Belshazzar and the handwriting on the wall, chapter 5, verses 1 through 31. And again, in all these, these center chapters here deal with the fact of you can't oppose God's hand. You can't hold it back and you cannot keep him from doing what he wants to do. We have Darius' foolish decree in 6, 1 through 28, and then we have Daniel's vision of the four beasts in 7, 1 through 28. So I take you there, and we'll just, again, introducing just briefly this for you. And what's covered here, and we'll come back and look at a little more detail next week. The dream in Daniel 7 moves far beyond Daniel's day to the coming of Israel's king to the end of all Gentile kingdoms and establish of his eternal kingdom. Chapters 2 and 7 of Daniel present the same general prophecy, but from different points of view. Both outline the entire period of the times of the Gentiles, which began with Nebuchadnezzar and will end with the return of Christ and His glory. This is the second return of Jesus Christ. So I just give you this overview just so you can get a visual perspective of what's happening. We have the Old Testament era, the church era. We have the seven years of tribulation. We have the millennial reign for a thousand years. And then we have the time of the Gentiles. It's going to stretch from the time of Nebuchadnezzar all the way till the return of Christ when he's going to come and establish his millennial reign. We are in the times of the Gentiles. This is the time in which God is in gathering to himself, calling to himself a people from both Jew and Gentile to bear his name. And Paul talks about the fact that there is a time that it's going to be fulfilled. The filling up of the Gentiles is going to come to an end, right? God is going to consummate everything that He's established. But this is the time of the Gentiles, and it stretches from Israel's fall in 2 Kings 25, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, and it's going to, be, it's going to end in Israel's restoration in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. So this is just a broad scope. Right? To just get a broad perspective of what's happening. And if we can add all the other details to it, we have the church era beginning with Christ. We have the rapture of the church, which is going to happen before the tribulation, I believe. And we have the second coming of Christ, which is going to be before the millennium. And then he will establish his kingdom and reign for a thousand years. And then we will have the new heaven and the new earth. That is my eschatology as I see it thus far. <clears throat> And I can't make a chart for you for, for that if you'd like. We have the vision recorded for us in chapter 7, verses 1 through 14, and then its interpretation in 7, 15 through 28. So we're going to have the four beasts. And so I would suggest that you read through this again for next week. Read through the four beasts. We're going to have the coming of the Son of Man. But all, these is going to, all this is going to picture this broad span of time. And so if we can put it this way and looking at the rest of everything, and we looked at this last time, we looked at Daniel, but starting in 605 B.C., we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome 1, and then Rome 2, and then the kingdom of the Son of Man. 
and his reign on the earth. And so that's the progression of the kingdoms and how we see this in Daniel. If I can put it to you this way, now this is, this is something new I haven't done before, to try and give you a visual of what's happening overall time-wise. So the times of the Gentiles, we start with Babylon, the head of gold in chapter 2, the lion with eagle's wings in chapter 7. Okay? Medo-Persia, the arms and breasts of silver in chapter 2, the bear with three ribs in its teeth in chapter 7. We have Greece, the belly and the thighs of bronze, chapter 2, the beast like leopard in chapter 7. We have Rome, the legs of iron in chapter 2, the nameless beast with iron teeth in chapter 7. Now right here is the great parenthesis. This is the church age. God didn't reveal this to Daniel. Daniel had no idea about the church. He's just looking at the great movements of the kingdoms. Notice with me in, in Ephesians chapter 3. This is, this is why this is such an amazing statement by Paul. In Ephesians chapter 3, I'll start in verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Prophets here coming after apostles. This is New Testament prophets, not Old Testament prophets. The church and that mystery of God that, that pertained to the church and Him bringing Jew and Gentile together, making one new man, that was hidden from the Old Testament. They had no idea about the church. This was a revelation that was now being given, and Apostle Paul was one who was giving this revelation to explain what God was doing. So Daniel didn't have a clue about it. So we have this great parenthesis that comes. Then notice what happens. We have the revived Rome, the feet and ten toes of iron and clay in chapter 2, and the ten horns of the fourth beast and the little horn in chapter 7. And then we have the return of Christ, the smiting stone in chapter 2, the coming of the Son of Man in glory in chapter 7. This is, if you will, my eschatology. This is the picture of, of all of the times, right? This is... The times of the Gentiles in which we are in, going back to the past and looking all the way to the millennial reign of Christ, this is what's happened, right, in a nutshell. It, it changes things, right? Doesn't it change how we view life when we understand the great scope of what's going on? This is the frustration I have with pastors sometimes is because far too often they're trying to build their own little kingdom. And this is, you look at most mega churches, right? This is what they're trying to do. They're building their own kingdom and they're not realizing that the church is just a small part of God's kingdom plan. And we all ought to be building into this and living for it and living in light of it. Now, this is a staggering because I was talking to my dad today. Back in his day, Matthew chapters 5 through 7 would not be taught on or preached on. Why? Because they believed that those were principles for the kingdom that was still future. They didn't understand that there was an already manifestation of the kingdom in the sense that God was reigning in our hearts now. But what do you do when Matthew says, Blessed are you, right? For yours is the kingdom of God. Not will be, it is. We're already possessors of it. We were already brought into it, although the church is not the kingdom. But we are possessors of the kingdom, and we are a part of the peoples who will make up that consummation of the kingdom. But for years, they would not preach on those chapters. They wouldn't even teach them in classrooms, in Bible schools, because they believed that those were kingdom principles, and they were solely for the future. So this is a more recent thing when people start understanding, yes, there are passages that talk about the future kingdom, but there are also passages that talk about the kingdom now, right? The sovereign reign of God now. I mean, what do you do with Christ in Ephesians chapter 1 when he's sitting, right, with everything is submitted to under his feet? Is he not reigning? Absolutely. But then we know that later every tongue is going to confess, every knee is going to bow, and all things then ultimately are going to be put in subjection unto him. So there is this already and not yet aspect that we find. So just to say, it's, it's so poor for us to understand the big picture of things. It, it, it resolves problems in our lives. When we start to, to, to get frustrated, we look at things around us and we wonder just if, if anyone's in control. We just stop and remind ourselves God's in control, right? If he can move empires, can he not then move our life? <laughs> 
As I talked with the kids the other night, if God can create the universe, and we talked about the vastness of the galaxy and galaxies, and God is not contained in that, he is outside of all of that, so God cannot be contained within the universe, he is even outside the universe, so you really can't even ask the question, where is God? If that is God, and he is so awesome and so infinite and so transcendent and so powerful, if he can create the universe and all the stars and everything else, can he not then create solutions to our problems in life? And the answer is absolutely. My question is, why do we always doubt? When he can move empires, can he not just take care of our simple households? The answer is absolutely yes. But why do we doubt? We're like the disciples in the boat. Oh, we didn't bring bread. How are we going to eat? I just fed 5,000. I just fed 4,000. Can I feed 13? Right? How foolish we are. So Daniel's going to move us to the prophetic plan for Israel in chapter 8, verse 1 through 12 through 13. Daniel's vision of the ram and the male goat, we'll look at that next week. The vision comes in the verses 1 through 14 in the interpretation of 15 through 27. Daniel's vision of the 77s, we're not going to get into that, but that's far much beyond where we need to go for our, what we need to do for history of the New Testament. Uh, we'll save that for a later day. And then Daniel's vision of Israel's future. So this will open the door. We'll come back and look at these prophecies, look at the different periods of these kingdoms and the reign and the influence that it had in setting the times for the New Testament. I don't want to stop. I'm done. Okay. Stop away. Bye. Uh...